Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this first parallel session of Open Repositories 2012. Uh, my name is Richard Green. Um, as some of you will know, I work with the repositories team at the University of Hull, and I was recently, let's say, elected to the steering committee for the whole Open Repository series, so the, the steering committee that sits behind you know, Open Repository 2 right through to wherever we get to rather than the, the local steering committee. Um, I'm going to chair this afternoon's sessions. Um, I've, I, I'm either very favoured or I've been very naughty, and I'm not sure which, because I've been given one of the two and a half hour sessions to chair, which is a bit of a marathon, I think, especially on a, in a warm lecture theatre late on a, a Tuesday afternoon, but let's, let's do our best. Um, I've got one or two notices I've been asked to bring to your attention. Um, talk about the session itself in a moment, but I should tell you that this session is being recorded for posterity, and particularly when we get to the questions after each speaker, if you want to ask a question but don't want to be on the recording, then please make that clear when you start speaking. Um, I think it's likely that people may want to move between the parallel sessions this afternoon. I don't necessarily expect you all to, to stay here for all five. Equally, I expect there will be people coming in from the other one to this at some stage. But what I would ask you, please, is if you are going to move between the sessions, if you do it during the, the, the gaps between speakers rather than during their presentations themselves. And, and again, sort of on the uh, level of courtesy, um, if you've got mobile phones in your pockets, I'd be grateful if you'd switch them into silent mode uh, before we start. That would be much appreciated. I think that's basically it. So this afternoon we've got a, a five presentations on shared repository services and infrastructure. And the first speaker up this afternoon is Andrew Dorwood, who is going to talk about the development of a socio-technical infrastructure to support open access publishing through institutional repositories. Um, I've got a stopwatch on my computer over there. This is for all the speakers that I've set at 22 and a half minutes. You can see it as well as me but I will wave flags and eventually wave my arms at you if you're up. <laughs> so, Andrew, you're up. Thanks, Richard. <clears throat> it's a very long title for a, a fairly simple concept. What UK Repository Net, or otherwise known as RepNet, is all about is, like all good revolutionaries, we're trying to create an infrastructure before the revolution actually happens. And we're anticipating that at some point in the very near future, open access is going to go mainstream with the p publication of the Finch Report. It looks like it will happen sooner than we originally envisaged when we started the project last August. So our aim is to have that infrastructure in place for the UK and perhaps a, also a, a template that can be followed for Europe uh, by the time that uh, the switch is flipped and open access comes mainstream. So what is, what is RepNet? As I say, it's a social technical infrastructure, so it's not just a technical system. It's also a help desk, it's support, it's to get it, all of the, the human interaction to help to manage data and also to help our clients, the uh, I, internet, uh, IR managers, to actually make this happen. The aim is to justify the investment that JISC have made over the last 10 years into the infrastructure of repositories and to put repositories at the centre of open access dissemination. How do we do it? We're going to build a, a really good suite of services from our SIPG. These are our service, uh, service partners at the moment. That's uh, uh, Yukon, um, Mimus, Edina and Nottingham. And to roll these out and to take that from a project into a fully sustainable service. So what, how we started was we went out and we mapped the publishing landscape, which is a fairly complex place. Uh, this is a simple model, but what this shows is the kind of the food chain of publication, starting with the funders who fund a project, the academics who do the research and start to produce the research outcomes, which are the research articles, the publishers who will publish this, provide some of the metadata, and the institutions where the academics reside. And then in the middle, we started to map out the relationships between subject repositories, the funder repositories, the institutional repositories, and of course the CRIS systems. And what we found was that uh, 
this segmented quite nicely into two triangles. So the top here you have where the publishers sit, that's all about open access publishing. And down at the bottom here, it's about research information management. And our project kind of sits in the middle of these two, two, two sides of the triangle. So we built this out and we filled in some of the gaps and it started to, cr started to create a picture for us which became very interesting. So we were able to differentiate between the two types of open access, between green open access of the author's final copy, the publisher's final copy which the publishers are providing as a service. We were able to look in more detail at um, standards like Serif and SORD that we wanted to use. We identified some of the main players like uh, UK Core, uh, the Association of Research Managers who we were going out and talking to. So we talked to all of our constituents, we talked to the funders, we t had some conversations with the publishers, we talked a lot with the IR managers and uh, we talked with people from the institutions and we put together a great big catalogue of every service and every component we could possibly think that might go into a useful suite of services for running this. And what that gave us was uh, an idea of what this could look like that as we gradually honed down that catalogue to create the Wave 1 and Wave 2 components, we were able to construct a kind of triple tier architecture. And this is what RepNet actually is. So the top tier is obviously our clients who are the funder repositories, subject repositories, institutional repositories. And then we kind of sit in the middle. So what we do is we offer the service support, which is a way of pulling together all of the services that are being created by our service partners, uh, so providing the glue that makes that hold together. And one of the things we were doing this morning is we were running a workshop where uh, we were beginning to look at how we will be able to integrate these services uh, more closely. We also operate a service desk, which is really important, so that we can provide technical support, we can answer, answer questions by phone or, or by email, and we can start to log issues that there might be with the services. And we also have our components catalogue, which is, will become our service directory, so services that are not necessarily provided by us or hosted by us, such as curation, preservation, microservices, they are included within that service directory, so you as IR managers and clients have access to all of that. Then down at the bottom, you have um, the hosting of the service components. Some of them are hosted by us at, at Adena, some of them are, are hosted by Mimus at Manchester. Uh, some of them will be host, hosted remotely. Uh, on the left hand side there we have the innovation zone. This is the service provided by UCall, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on, but a, a way of managing prototype ideas, concepts uh, that may be eventually become services and moving them into the full industrial strength um, production environment that we're building. So in terms of what we provide, we provide, as I say, this, this big, heavy uh, hosting infrastructure, including a testing infrastructure. So as services move into production, uh, we provide scripts for testing them to make sure that they're robust, they're going to stand up, they will be there 24-7 for our clients. We also provide uh, failover replication, so this thing is going, to be, it's going to be good to use. The help desk and support, um, that's kind of the, the social side of the infrastructure. I uh, provide that through uh, the DINA help desk. Um, so we log all of our calls that come in using the Helios call management system. Uh, we have technical support, so issues are logged into Redmine for bug tracking, issue tracking, uh, new suggestions for new services. And uh, we also work with our, compon our, our component providers uh, as a third level of, uh, of possible support. So there's a good infrastructure in there to help people out. High level plan, as I say, we started uh, last August with um, going out and talking to our constituents. We produced the, the components catalog. We went through a, a long process of selecting components. We got the sign off from JISC in January of the components that were going to be in, in wave one. Uh, we started to integrate them. We've got business plans in from all of our service providers. At the moment, the guys are all wor working on the business plans and actually doing the development. That will gradually mature through between September and in the, the end of the year 
then we'll start to be in a position where we can actually implement some of the services for Wave 2. So where we are right now, uh, this is our website. So it's a production website, it's got a blog, it's got areas where you can click on for all of the important areas like depositing and reporting and uh, information on, on policies for funders and for publishers. I should say at the moment it's a, it's a very loose kind of portal because the services have not really been developed to the, to the stage that we need them to be at and that's being followed through in the business plans but it gives you an idea of what the thing will look like and the kind of services that will be provided through it. At the moment, uh, as I say, with Wave 1, it is, it is pretty loose. It's a series of kind of siloed projects, but at least it's all pulled together into one portal so that people can see what's out, what's out there. By Wave 2 in September, that will become more closely integrated, so we will actually be hosting some of the services, such as the existing services from Sherpa, Romeo and Juliet on, at, at Adena, uh, we've also commissioned some research into, into search because we had lots of possible services for search and we had to uh, filter these out quite, quite quickly and we actually com uh, we've commissioned some research into that to give us an idea of how we can make Google and Microsoft fit for service and at the same time use some of the, the multifaceted search engines such as I IRS and, uh, and Oyster. So it'll start coming together more closely in September. Uh, we work very closely with uh, UCOL and they provide what we call the Innovation Zone. And the Innovation Zone is a way of kind of developing new ideas. So the first thing that we've got in the Innovation Zone is our component catalogue, which is there as a web service. So it's becoming quite interactive and you're welcome to go on there and have a look and see what's there and contribute to that. that there's various different mechanisms through JISC of getting new ideas in uh, for Wave 2, but the idea is that all of them go into the, into the data zone, in, into the innovation zone, in whatever state they're in. We then test the APIs and we bring these through into, the, into full service, which means going into the, the production environment on the right. In terms of the overall context and scope and focus, uh, it's a good way of thinking about this because context, we think of things like uh, open access, government policy, funder mandates, publisher practices. Th this is all stuff that we can't control, but we need to be aware of it and keep a watching brief on a lot of that stuff. Then there's the scope, which is kind of stuff that's happening around our project. To some extent, we can control it, we can influence it, um, but is not part of our initial focus, which we defined back in August. And that's things like gold open access payment me mechanisms, integration with research data sets, and cooperation with open air. But our, our main focus at the moment, as I say, is integrating the existing services. <coughs> We're very lucky in the UK because I was talking to one of my client, uh, uh, colleagues at open air last night, and he said, you're, you're very lucky living in a strong country because our government is at right behind open access. And David Willits gave this speech where basically he was painting on the wall in great big letters, things are going to change and they're going to have to change quickly. Nelly Cruz has been doing the same thing in the EC. Uh, the Finch report is showing that gold open access is going to happen probably more quickly than, than we originally envisaged. Uh, in terms of funder mandates, a lot of that stuff is happening with, um, with mandates at the minute. Uh, publisher practices. The peer end of project review showed that publishers, not surprise, surprise, were overwhelmingly in favour of, uh, of gold, gold OA as a way forward. So as part of scope, um, one of the things that we keep an an, a watching brief on is payment mechanisms for gold open access because we believe that if the market is going to be truly transparent for, uh, for publication fees for the um, AFCs, then it's got, there has to be a free market for doing that. And the best way to create a free market is for it probably to be handled at an institutional level and to be handled through the universities rather than through the publishers. The moment they don't, they don't exist, it's going to be a big barrier to gold open access happening. In terms of re research data sets, again, it's outside the focus of our project, but we're encouraged that it's, they are within the REOX guidelines and the, they were the focus of a big conference at Nordbib in Copenhagen. Uh, we're having a very fr fruitful dialogue with um, Open Air at the moment. You're going to hear from Nar Nar Narjla at the, 
on the next presentation and there's a lot of synergy between what we've been doing over the last eight months and what, what they've been doing, what they're developing with um, uh, Open Air Plus. So the focus at the moment is very much about optimising the Wave 1 components. Uh, what we've got in there for Wave 1, it's a very comprehensive set of tools because what we've got is information on, fu on publisher policies, funder policies, uh, we've got some really strong deposit tools and we've got a very good set of counter-compliant tools that will allow us to report and, me and measure impact. Uh, we're also looking at the Wave 2 service components and as you can see as part of the process for that is things like this conference and the workshop that were held this morning where we've got several fantastic jewels of uh, possibilities for how the existing Wave 1 components can be, can be enhanced. So the components that we've got in Wave 1, we broke these down to five areas of search, uh, benchmarking, reporting, a registry of IRs, open access IRs, uh, deposit tools, and tools to enhance metadata quality. And from that, as I say, we had three candidates for search. They've all been put in the innovation zone, and the research that we've that we've uh, commissioned will help us to understand how we can bring these into service in a, in a meaningful way. Uh, for metadata quality, we've also got the Names2 project, which is in the innovation zone, and ultimately we want to align that uh, with ORCID so we can create a naming authority file for, um, for authors and, re and researchers. Then on the rel relevant registries, we've got a couple of candidates, which is Open Door and Roar. It, it was decided by JISC that we put that out as an ITT. The ITT has to be issued by JISC, but eventually, I hope, perhaps by the end of the year, beginning of next year, we actually will have one unified uh, registry of, uh, of repositories. So as part of Wave 1, we've got uh, Iris UK provided by MIMAS, which provides our, our reporting and benchmarking facil facility. It's all counter compliant. It, it will be the first one in the world that will give you an overall global view of what's happening in terms of downloads from repositories and, and impact. Uh, we also have Romeo and Juliet. Romeo gives information on publisher policies, Juliet on funder policies. And we also have the RJ Broker, which is our, in an, our intelligent piece of middleware for getting deposits into the right repository from publishers or from, fr from researchers. In terms of the implementation roadmap, very busy slide, the takeaway from this is we use ITIL as our process for bringing projects into services, into production. And it's, ITIL is a fantastic language because it provides a clear methodology and a way of making it clear to all of our service partners exactly what they need to do to get their projects or their ideas or the concepts into the production environment. We're also producing a sustainability plan because we're well aware that uh, with the current um, environment at JISC we can't be reliant on JISC funding forever and ever. So we've had the SIPG me members produce their own individual sustainability plans and these follow various different business models of subscriptions, voluntary contributions, payment for use of data. So by the end of this year or by, Mar by the end of the project in March, we actually will have a, a, an overall sustainability plan for the fully integrated service. Uh, there's also the possibility of fur further underpinning by JISC but we simply don't know about that as well at the moment. So this again is a, it's an alternative view of the infrastructure and it's a nice one because it shows the overall service portfolio which consists of ideas, concepts, things that are being tested and things that are in production. In the service catalogue you have your, your, ser your, your, your services that are provided by the service providers and also, also by third party component providers. And then we also have this ITIL concept of services that will be retired, because there will be some services that will no longer be fit for use, they'll be taken out of production, they'll be put back in the, in the innovation zone, and then tweaked or used or available to developers so that we can find a, a way of bring, possibly bringing them back into service if there's a demand for it. <coughs> so in summary, we're very encouraged because while there's relatively few services within Wave 1, the services that we've got in there actually give 
we think, everything that we need to support uh, green open access. So you've got the deposit tools with the RJ Broker and ORI. You've got some very powerful tools for, um, uh, for, for deposit. Uh, with the IRIS project at MIMAS, we've got the world's very first fully counter-compliant way of measuring statistics and beginning to get some very interesting altmetrics type of information flowing through and beginning, beginning to be a little bit disruptive about the current kind of citation mafia and the way that that is actually run. IRIS will start to give us a, a, a lot of information about what's happening in repositories and ways of benchmarking repositories against each other and measuring impact of research outcomes of articles. And then we have the the data that we're getting from Romeo and Juliet on the publisher policy, funder policy. We had a lot of good ideas this morning about machine-to-machine uh, -machine, um, uh, in integration to, to try to automate that process a, a little more. It's a very, it's a very human-intensive process at the moment. So we're we're very encouraged that even with the Wave One stuff, we've got a pretty pretty good infrastructure that can actually be used going forward for open access. As I say, it'll help to justify JISC's invent, investment in the infrastructure. Uh, our aim at the moment, our, our real focus, is to move to this data-driven infrastructure because, as you can imagine at the moment, we've got a series of projects that don't talk to each other. So as part of the business plans, we're building APIs between these different systems so that they can talk to each other, so the reporting mechanism can get it information from Romeo and Juliet, we can start to use the RJ broker in some fairly innovative ways. So the whole thing starts to open up and it starts to become more integrated and more useful and we've got many, many ideas about how we want to do this going forward. At the moment we're building the, the technical platform to allow this to actually happen. Wave 2, at the moment we'll, we're focusing on, on microservices, particularly in the area of curation and preservation, working with the University of California Digital Library to try to bring some of these ideas into focus, but a lot of them are contained within the uh, service catalogue, which is up on the, on the innovation zone at the moment. And then lastly, the sustainability plan is something that's very important. We're working with our partners on that, and that we hope to have that ready to go in March next year so that this thing can run and run forever and all, always be there. So that's, uh, that's my talk. Um, are there any questions? No. Right, if there's no questions, I'll uh, hand. Uh, 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 sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Just because they haven't got a question uh, doesn't mean right. that I haven't. Right, right, right. <laughs> Actually, mine's a slightly naughty question, I, 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 I have to admit. But it, it just occurred to me as you were speaking, and, and having listened to the, the wonderful sort of plenary session we had a couple of hours ago, which I, I thought was great. What you've talked about here, Andrew, is, is stuff that we, dare I say, as academics or people working with academics, can see our way around. We can see how it's going to work. We can see how we can access it, what it's going to do for us. Have you any plans, even if they're sort of a way down the, 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 the road map, for making this material and these, these sorts of pieces of information available to non-academics? You know, what's the general public going to do with it, particularly <coughs> in view of what will it said? Hi. Well, that's, that's really focused around search, because what I think for, for non-academics, probably discover, discoverability of research information is the most important thing. And at the moment, the, the main way in is through Google and Microsoft, because that's, these are the tools people use. So one of the things that we're looking at at the moment is trying to enhance the metadata that's uh, held in repositories so that it becomes discoverable by Google and Microsoft and these very common search tools. Because one of the things that our, our research has, has brought up is that there's a vast gap between the information that is surfaced through professional tools like I IRS and Oyster which go right deep into the metadata and the full text and do the full text harvesting and what you get from Google. And the difference is quite shocking. So that's really the way that we want to try to expose this to the general public. Because I think the general public, they really don't care very much about how you deposit stuff, but they're deeply interested in how you can discover stuff. And 
I think that's that's going to be a very fruitful route for us for 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 Joe Public. <laughs> um, so you, you're right, in terms of the access, I think it's been well described by, by Andrew. In terms of deposit of those non affiliates or of those that don't have an issue to repository, um, we're in a Nadina hat, we should say that one of the things we did with GSG early on uh, was develop the depot, so you know, put it in the depot, and then that we have transmogrified into the opendepot.org. So that is a repository which is on the net, at web scale, so to speak, that for the non affiliates. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks very much.